two, and I'm <laughs> going to call the um, library board meeting to order. Um, Marie, I'm assuming that I'm just taking over since you're remote. So I'm going to go <laughs> yes, ahead and just keep tonight, on, yeah. keep them on. Yes, yes, yes. And Maggie, you. Okay. Cool. Uh, roll call. All right. Chair Marie Hoda. Here. Vice Chair Gina Oberding. Present. Maggie Burns. Here. Luke Curtis. Here. Kyle Davenport. Here. Edie Hughes. Here. Dina Phelps. Here. Amy Wilson. Here. And excused, we have Chris Ray and City Council Liaison Chelsea Noonan Camp. And staff, we have Director Christina Underhill and Library and Cultural Arts Manager Bethany Lafferty. And guests or staff, we also have Hannah Kinney and Rachel Steen with the library. Great. Thank you, everybody. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to July. Uh, we have two new board members. Ta da! So, this is great. Um, so, we would love to get to know you both, Kyle and Luke, and um, for you to get to know us a little bit. So, if you don't mind, we'll kind of go around and do a little intros of ourselves, and then we'd love to hear a little bit about you. If that's Okay, so I'm Gina Oberding. I'm the assistant. Um, my title in real life is assistant director. I'm not that here. I'm the <laughs> vice chair of this board. And I've been on the board for a year and a half, so we know that you would think I would know what my title is. Um, in my life outside of this, I do work in prescription drug abuse prevention. And so um, there's that. We can always talk about that. So, um, Edie, do you want to go ahead and introduce you? Well, Debbie, I'm assuming you have. We've been in. We did, yeah, okay. before the meeting started. Okay, great. Edie. I'm Edie Hughes. I've been on the board, I think, some two years. Yeah. Here you go. Uh, I'm retired. I moved to Englewood about two and a half years ago. Hi, I'm been on the board for. I'm a pastor here in the city. I've lived in England for yeah. I've been on the board for two and a half years. <laughs> um, I lived in England about four and a half years um, or four years. Um, and I'm an operational excellence specialist in supply chain in outside of my library. I'm Beth Lafferty, I'm the library manager. Um, I have been in this role for a little over two years. Um, I moved to Colorado from Southern Nevada um, to take this position. So I have, I was in public libraries in Henderson and Las Vegas, Nevada for about 17 years and about a year of public libraries in um, Chicago and area where I'm originally from. So I'm the school board being um, I've been in Inglewood for about a decade, and I've been outside of my school board job and this board. Uh, I'm in real estate. Uh, and I'll continue with the board, and then we'll go to staff, and then the two of you. That's okay. Okay. Amy, just a brief introduction. Yep. Hi there. I'm Amy Wilson. I lived in uh, Inglewood about 20 years. I've been on the board at least five, probably more like seven. Um, and I work for the city and county of Denver in child protection. Oh, welcome, new members. And Marie? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Marie Hota. I have been in Inglewood since 2013, so 11 years now. And I've been on the board since 2019, five and a half years now, which is wild. Um, and yep, I'm a stay at home mom. I do a lot of work in the community with the library. I do a lot with the schools and I'm really glad to have two new dedicated members on the board. So thank you. Great. And then we have um, staff that you're doing something wonderful. Hi, I'm Hannah. Uh, I'm a full-time circulation librarian here in the library. I worked here a little over a year and a half. Um, I moved to Colorado to get my master's in library science Okay, I'll figure out here. Well, so. yeah. mm -hmm. My name is Rachel. I am 
Same thing as Hannah, but on the reference adult services side of the project. Um, I'm almost at three years here. I started off with a sub substitute library services associate. And yeah, got these jobs at the same time. Um, also connected to Colorado for an MIS. Um, okay. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Luke Ferris. I've been on the board for uh, one day, <laughs> less than an hour. Uh, I've lived in Inglewood for about four and a half years and uh, very excited to get involved. And uh, I work for Jefferson County Fraud Investigator uh, outside of, of this, but excited to be part of this board. Uh, I work with the Inglewood Library just a little bit, just being a resident. Like it, so excited to be here. Glad having you. Kyle Davenport. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. I um, I'm an attorney at the Colorado Attorney General's Office for my day job. I uh, I'm a Colorado native. I grew up in Aurora, and um, this is my second stint on the library board. I was on the Arapaho Library Board for three years, from 2015 to 2018. Excited to be back. Right. We look forward to learning from you. Uh, Those of us that this is their first round. So, <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to move on to the agenda. And thank you both for being interested in, in working with us. We look forward to learning from you and for you know, your contributions. Um, so, approval of the minutes. Did everyone get a chance to look at those? Are there any edits that are needed? Debbie, for being so great at keeping. Us on track in the minutes. Um, anyone want a motion to approve the minutes as written? I'll move to approve the minutes. Thanks, Megan. I'll second. And all in favor of approving the minutes as written? Aye. 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 The two of you have to now officially vote. Okay. I believe. Aye. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, not to pray for you, but you know, your first task is to vote on something. Um, recognition of public comment. Um, I don't know that we have any. We do not. Okay. But I did notice we have a guest with us. Did you want to introduce yourself or? I can add it before it's live. Sure. sure. Yeah. So my name is Shao Young, and I am a little resident, have been for one and a half years, and a guest of the Great. And um, we're at the Oh, great. Nice to have you. I was thinking it's odd if there's, I mean, I mean, I'm not used to being having a crowd of people here, so it just feels odd if there's someone there and you're like just saying hello to them. So nice to have you. Thank you. Um, reports, Beth. All right. Um, so um, the library statistical report, let's start with that one first. Um, we open um, all 30 days of June. And um, had 1,200 visitors over last June, so that's good. Um, a couple of things I wanted to point out. Um, so while we haven't quite reached our goals for library cardholder uh, increase, um, we did have an increase of overall library cardholders of 11.6% and residents of 9.74% from May to June, or maybe that's for the whole year. Sorry, that's from like the end of 2023 through June. So, um, we're on our way of I think our goal was to hit like 15 and 25 percent, respectively. Not in the action plan, but I just wanted to point that out. Um, other items of note, um, our total questions, um, asked we had. 2788. Um, and again, the majority of those are for adults. Um, there was 111 questions for uh, for children under the age of 13 and 25 teen questions. The top 50% categories of questions asked were um, the questions about accounts, um, that was 17 and a half percent, supplies, 15.4%. And again, supplies could be anything from providing scissors, staples, um, earbuds. Um, snack bags that we provide in water. Um, and then just general directions within the space of the library room was 8.5%, room reservations were 7.7%. And then uh, 
questions regarding events or program 7.8. After like 56 percent of the questions asked for those um, categories. We had 262 volunteer hours. Um, 14 of there was 14 adults who volunteered 100 hours, and then um, 24 teens that volunteered 162 hours. We also have starting in June. Um, Kimberly Powers, the children and teen librarian, she is doing a special teen internship for three um, teens that have been regular library uh, program attendees in the past that have recently graduated high school and they wanted to kind of know a little bit more about the ins and outs of working in the library. So there are three teens and they spent 12 hours in June learning about different facets of the library and then they're continuing through July and I think one or two weeks into August. So that's kind of an additional, um, not really a volunteer thing, but it's just kind of a cool thing that she's offering uh, special to those kids. And then, let's see. The only other thing I was gonna point out was again, um, the our total deposits for the year is a lot more than last year. So like year to date through um, June, we have over $11,000 that the library has brought in. Um, and for the month of June, that was $2,200. And that was $520 from rental fees, $443 from copies, um, and $586 of donations. And then there was also, The library for sale was just like $140 um, for the month of June, but um, room rentals are definitely picking up. So people renting this um, meeting space or the parent room, which is at the opposite end of the library, we are seeing a lot more use of that. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that we do have the ability to let people register or like reserve the room online themselves directly. So we've been seeing a bit of an increase in the room usage and that's translated into some additional um, revenues and the donations for this month, some of those were the donations for that um, young girl that I told you guys about last month. Um, so that one ended up totaling a little over $1,500. So I just think that's pretty good. And we um, have just like been bringing in a lot more than we did last year. So does anybody have any questions about anything in particular in the statistical report? Um, and uh, anything, Kyle, if you guys have any questions that you want to have a little bit more explanation on, please feel free. Of, like what the information is included. I know it's really me. I have a question. Yeah. What, why are some of the numbers in orange or red? So the orange numbers just denote the totals for those categories. Oh, okay. Um, so like you'll see it in the programs. Uh, so there's children, young adult, and adult. And so the orange ones are just like, the total number of programs and the total attendance. And then the very bottom is just like all the programs total. And I still don't have the page views for the catalog. I just don't have access to that data. So that's the little yellow mark at the top. Um, it's just, I don't have access to that data right now. Did anything stand out to you from the last month in the next report? Um, not really. Um, I do make a summary every month. Um, I guess it's a great for anything. Oh. No, I mean, nothing with that was a uh, And I think a, a couple of the exclusions were just like they started out as like injection, injection, exclusion. So like, you know, kind of escalating up to that or like a verbal warning and then an injection and then they finally were excluded. Um, but there is nothing that was outrageously unusual or concerning. Is that the bell? Definitely. <laughs> so. 
is exclusion permanent? No, exclusions are, are basically temporary. Um, the city of Inglewood has a standards of behavior um, that the library um, and all city facilities follow. Um, and violations of the standards of behavior can result in either a verbal warning, a 24 hour ejection, or an exclusion for a period of time ranging anywhere from 45 days up to 180 days, the maximum, depending on the infraction and the frequent, if there's have, have been any prior exclusions. Any other comments or reflections on numbers? Um, Beth, there's anything ever that, you know, where when you see a number and you think you should do something with this, or we've seen an increase in this, you know, it's it's resulted from our activities in this or that. You know, there's anything that we can do to help support um, your goals and objectives. You know, please let us know. I know we kind of go through these numbers and it, but to me, I'm like, how does it translate into um, you know what we want to do for the city right how we're as a library supporting city efforts so think about that how does this translate into that so if there's anything that kind of stands out and you're like this kind of seems to be working you know i do some support in this area i think that's where i would like us as a board to support those efforts right so thank you yeah yeah i try to pick things to highlight that mm -hmm. i think are Yeah, worthy. absolutely. Um, and then I know in the action plan, we have a goal of trying to increase our card holders. So I haven't done it every single month, but I try to check it and just see, hey, are we making progress towards what we wanted to see as an overall annual increase? And I think we're, we're making our way towards it. Super. Yeah, and it's, it's exciting to hear about the opportunity for these high school students to learn a little bit more about mm -hmm. our these high school students to learn from uh, Kimberly. So, super. Okay, um, moving along the action plan, Beth. Um, so, actually, I got a pretty decent update for all of the categories. So, for adult services, kind of the highlights is that um, Corinne and her team um, and is working on creating some computer classes for the Mali Center. So they already established doing the tech assist, which is kind of like open door, bring in your technology questions. Um, and so now um, library associate Katie Berry is going to be working on using some resources um, from a couple of places. There's um, digitallearn.org, and I don't actually know what it stands for from AARP, but some kind of resource um, from AARP, and uh, she's gonna develop some lessons, I guess, for computer instruction, and that will take place at Mali. So that, that's kind of in the works, um, and that's kind of working towards, um, you know, collaborating with the Mali Senior Center a little bit more. Um, and then again, the tech assists have been confirmed as a monthly offering on the second Wednesday each month. Um, and then library associate Regina Scove is attending the weekly Change the Trend meetings. And if you're not familiar with Change the Trend, it's a, a group of different organizations. Maggie, do you participate in Change the Trend? Uh, I don't need to. Okay. Um, it's a, just a group of organizations that come together for a, month, a weekly meeting to discuss issues surrounding um, serving people who are unhoused and you know have other high needs and are kind of underserved through uh, traditional means. So. She participates in that weekly, and Corinne um, Burnett, the adult services supervisor, tries to make that um, at least once a month. Um, let's see. And then Corinne is also working with somebody from Hat Force um, to establish some office hours here in the library. So we're probably going to set them up in like one of the study rooms as we get closer to the cold weather months so that they can connect with folks that might need resources during the cold weather months. Um, and then uh, Regina has been working with 52 Movement 5280 um, to offer, um, they are coming by, people from Movement 5280 are coming by the Civic Center to pick up um, folks that might need um, access to another space that's cool and a place to stay, you know, get clean uh, their clothes, take showers, get food and stuff like that. So they're doing that, I think, a couple times a week. That's not every day, right, Rachel? Okay, yeah, I thought it was just a couple of times a week. So that's been, you know, increasing that partnership with Movement 5280, and they've actually been bringing a cooler of 
filled with ice and water bottles that we keep in the library for folks to grab um, on hot days. So, um, oh, and then additionally with 5280, Regina has been working with them to help folks get access to um, vital um, personal information records, so like birth certificates, social security cards, so that they can get either a driver's license or a state identification card. Uh, so I think she's helped a couple of people with that. And then we, like I said, the, the pantry supplies, that's kind of the water that they are providing. And then Corinne has also reestablished the library's partnership with Integrated Family Community Services uh, for pantry items. So they are um, donating some food items when they can. Um, is it still, is it weekly again? Just kind of sporadic, yeah. ISBS. It, oh, it's monthly, okay. Yeah, so monthly donation. Um, and then we use those items and put them into the snack bag that we make available. We have usually about a dozen or so uh, snack bags every day that we pass out. So that's adult services. Um, the children's team doesn't have a ton of stuff because they are super swamped during the summer with all of their summer reading programs and performers. Um, but like, as I mentioned with the statistical um, chart, um, Kimberly has started this special team internship with three teens. Um, I don't know that this is something she's going to do every year. It just so happened she had three, you know, seniors graduating high school that has this interest in, you know, knowing about the career potential for working in libraries. Um, so they um, spent two two-hour sessions during June in the library. Um, and then they will attend weekly sessions through June, or sorry, through July. And I actually will be meeting with them myself next week. I'm looking forward to that. Um, circulation. So I just want to, yeah, so in the um, campaign to increase library card holders, so it's increase all library card holders by 25% and residents by 15. So we're kind of about halfway there almost. Um, because like I said, total res registered cardholders is 11.6 increase and then residents is 9.74. So we're making progress and hopefully we'll get to that by the end of the year. Um, so patron experience supervisor Carrie Watson um, has completed the first full draft of the circulation operations manual. Um, and it's electronic format. So the staff at the circulation desk are kind of keeping that up on their computers for quick reference um, to ensure that they're consistently following um, processes and procedures regarding circulation. Um, and then Carrie and Corinne are gonna kind of collaborate to draft something similar that would apply to um, the reference desk for adults so that we're getting you know, consistent services um, across all staff members. So, like, um, and Hannah, oh yeah, you got volunteered for this. Hannah is um, working with one of the grantees from the City of Anglewood Sustainability Grant Program. Um, he, I think we mentioned, I don't know if we mentioned this last month or not, but at the induction burners to be part of our library thing. So Hannah is kind of in charge of the library thing. So she's working with, that gentleman to get that up and going. Um, and then four new board games have been purchased and added to the collection. And then we received a, um, a set of 10 copies of the book Remarkably Bright Creatures um, by Shelby Van Pelt to add to the book club bags, which is great. So that's a really popular book. Um, and then and then I mentioned the card. There. So, yeah, and I think for just a little background for Luke and Kyle, mm -hmm. um, since my time on the board, I've been really impressed with the amount of work that the library staff have done to clean up the data. And so a lot of data, data was old. It was people who had duplicate records, people who had used the library for a variety of things. And the library staff worked really worked very hard to get um, you know, cardholder, current cardholder information so that we can have better data. So we can say, we can set these goals mm -hmm. and say, how did we outreach? And I think that's just snowballed into, we now have these part partnerships and things. I think it's just been an extraordinary effort to really use some data in a very rich and robust way. So kudos to library staff for really, I mean, it was a lot of work, so. Yeah, and a good example, if you just look even into like the monthly for um, 
this year versus last year in the total registered patrons. Like last year, we had 20 over 23,000. Um, and the, the reason for that difference really is because we cleaned up a lot of the accounts last year that were duplicate um, or had, you know, been expired for many, many years, but we're still hanging out in our database. And so we've been trying to create a process that will kind of clean that up on a at least an annual or like twice a year um, rotation so that we have a more accurate look of how many people have cards with us. And then Carrie and I have been talking about trying to um, figure out how to kind of convey of the cardholders we have, how many of those accounts are active, like meaning like they've been used at least once in the last 30 to 60 days or something like that. So we're trying to kind of figure out the criteria that we would use to decide this is an active account. So I think that's been, to me, it's been a huge effort, but I also think it helps with us in thinking about how do we help support the community for partnerships and you know, the library staff continue to think of really wise partnerships, you know, so that we can, you know, make the library a really critical resource. So anyway. And yay, a remarkably bright creatures. Has anyone read it? It's so good. <laughs> I really liked it. I so love it. Yes. It's so great. Thank you. Thank you for the validation. Um, okay. 100%. And on to the last, oh, and on to library operations last poll. Yeah. So the last section, um, my update there is that um, I've been working on uh, reviewing and updating um, the job descriptions for all the library supervisors. And actually, it's a bit, a bit more of an undertaking than I anticipated. Um, so I have finished up with that and I need to kind of review my job description with Christina and then we'll be moving on to the actually the library associates first because we have the most number of those positions and because of all the part-time associates we have the turnover is a little bit more frequent so we want to get that one updated sooner and then then I'll go back and work on all the full-time uh, well, that the library associate will cover full time library associates and part time, and then I'll do all the librarian positions after that. Um, so I'm, I'm getting that all done. And that's also just so we can have job descriptions that really relate to what people are actually doing in um, in their roles. But it's also in conjunction with a greater performance management um, evaluation process that the city is establishing where they'll be looking at the job descriptions to help gauge performance evaluation on the annual basis. So I really want the job descriptions to reflect clearly what everybody is doing. So that's kind of part of that effort. Um, and then I have kind of planned out the dates for a fall book sale. Um, we'll be doing a call for donations the first week of September, and then the sale will take place um, September. That's a Thursday, Thursday through Saturday, September 12th to the 14th. Um, the Thursday will be 9.30 to 7.30. Friday will be 9.30 to 5. And then Saturday, there'll just be a 9.30 to 3 time frame sale, and it will be a $5 bag. Um, and we're actually going to try it in the puzzle area. So the sale that we did in the spring is the... North Lobby went really smoothly, and it was just so much easier that it was all on the same floor. Last fall, we did a book sale up in the second floor community room, and we got to found uh, donations for like three weeks, which was way more than we could manage, and it was a ton of work to lug everything upstairs. So we're just going to do one week of like active call for donations, and then we'll have just a three-day sale here in the library. So that's I'm um, going to be shaping up, so we'll probably have um, some opportunities for volunteering at the book sale itself or helping us set up or take down and stuff like that. So I'll have that stuff coming out later in August um, if you want to volunteer to help us out with any of that stuff. We're hoping to stage all the donations in this room and sort them and then bring them out to tables out there in the library. So it should be a much quicker process. So I'm excited about that. Um, I don't have like a monetary goal at this point. I feel like it kind of depends on how much stuff we have on hand and the quality of it to kind of decide like what we could realistically expect. Um, um, yeah. 
Beth, as you're planning ahead for that, there is no school on September 13th for Inglewood schools. So um, like perhaps you can either tap into resources with the youth um, volunteers that Kimberly has had all summer or um, additionally, like maybe reach out to the schools for advertising as something to do on that day off. Okay. Just something to do. Yeah, because when at the April sale, the children's books were gone in a couple hours. Like that yeah. stuff all went super fast. Um, and Hannah and I are working on putting together like an email, like a special email that's specifically about promoting the call for donations of the sale itself. Then I'll be working with the city's communications department for um, promotions and stuff like that too. So I'll add this, you know, getting that out to the schools in advance as well. Make sure it's in the parent newsletter. Cool. Make sure so it goes out to all the parents as well. So that you get our like graphics and stuff that we make. Sure you um, great. Any other comments or questions about the action plan? Reflections? I did want to just mention it's not officially in here because I didn't know about it at the time. But we do finally we do have our um Contract signed and completed for the library consultant to begin work on doing the library strategic plan. I do have an initial meeting with their project manager tomorrow morning um, where we'll kind of just talk about, you know, the plans that we need to make and start setting some like loose dates for the initial kickoff meeting for the library work team. And then we'll be looking at some dates kind of going further out. And I don't know what the preference would be for. I just not really sure how we're going to do it, but like we obviously want opportunity for the library board members to participate in certain things. We may have it where we just have him come to one of the board meetings to present some information. And because uh, I know we do have to be careful about having multiple board members in a single meeting. Is that right, Debbie? Because like three or more. OK, so we, we probably have to keep it. Which is not a, not I mean, not a problem. We just have to advertise it. Oh, OK, yeah. yeah. So we're going to have some different like stakeholder meetings and stuff like that. So and a lot of them will be open to the public because we're going to invite public people to it. But um, so we'll have a bunch of different types of opportunities for feedback and input from the library board. So that is getting underway. Who oh, is the consultant? Oh, yeah. I'm so glad you asked that. I can't believe I didn't say that. So the consultant firm is called Barry Dunn. Um, they are officially based out of Portland, Oregon. But they do have um, the project manager, his name is J.R. Clanton. Um, he is based here in Colorado um, and has um, experience previously as a you know, librarian and um, supervisor and manager for the city of Westminster Public Library um, and then other um, library um, serving entities in the state. So we do have a local person on the project team from the consultant, so that's really great. Are they do they do almost exclusively library? They actually um have kind of a specialty within municipal governments, um, parks, recreation, and library. So it's one of the things we really liked about their proposal and their experience was that they have um, a, a depth of experience for working with libraries that are part of a parks and recreation department the way we are because um, we're not a standalone library district. So that that's nice to have somebody that has that perspective and then kind of understanding of the position that we are in within the greater organization of the city of Englewood. So that's all I got on the action plan, unless there's any questions. No, but I would welcome them to come to a board meeting. So. Yeah. And that's kind of what I anticipate we're going to kind of talk about tomorrow with like the different people that in like where do we want to meet that I had an issue and stuff like that. Yeah. Great. Great, great. Okay. All right. I'm gonna move us along the agenda here. Um so that was reports. Um so library doesn't have a budget. So if anyone has a dollar you can contribute down. Just kidding. It just said zero. So I felt like I should say you something. Spent all your money. We have spent it wisely on a variety of things, a lot of summer reading program things, staff development. So 
Uh, moving on to new business, uh, we have a review and approval of policies. We've got the Inglewood Public Library Patron uh, Privacy Policy and the Public Computer Practice Internet Policy. Um, I don't believe we've seen these before, so I don't believe we'd be voting on anything. It's up to you um, if you want to vote on it or not. Um, if you have a chance to you know, review them prior to the meeting. Um, basically, this is just formalizing a statement regarding patron privacy kind of pursuant to Colorado library law. Um, the library does not have a formal statement of patron privacy, um, which is something that's just kind of a a staple of what we should have. So I worked, I did a, like a lot of research of other library um, patron policy statements. Um, it kind of did a draft of the things that I thought were most pertinent for Englewood and then had the city attorney's office review my initial draft and they kind of like picked some of the wording and made the um, applicable laws explained a little bit more clearly. Um, so the gist of it is that um, you know, disclose the use of the library, whether it's like your what items you check out or what you were looking at on the computer or if you were even in the library. We don't keep tabs of that kind of stuff. Um, we don't keep any paper or electronic documents that contain personal and identifying information. Um, we don't release the information of a patron's account to unauthorized people. Um, and then the only thing, kind of information we would collect um, is pursuant to library operations. So if you're signing up for a library card, you'll need to provide your name, your address, a phone number, an email address, and a date of birth, uh, and then proof of your uh, local address. Um, and then for study room use, we just ask people to provide um, first and last name, email address, and preferably a phone number if they have one. Um, and then for computer use only cards, we just ask for first, last name, and date of birth. Um, and then this just states that the patron responsibility for reporting that their uh, their library card was lost or stolen, so that we can protect their account from unauthorized use. Um, but it is the um, cardholder's responsibility to notify the library. Um, and then parental access to a minor's account, and it's basically parents are responsible um, for materials that are checked out on a minor's account. And if they want to access the information on the account, they have to have their card number. And then if somebody wanted library records, they just have to follow, um, this is kind of pursuant to library law where they have to have um, a court order or a, like a judge issued subpoena um, and that would all go through the city attorney or city clerk's office. Or if there was a core request that goes to city clerks, we don't just release information directly from the library. Um, so that just kind of states what that process would be. So that's the patron privacy policy. Um, where, where would this be kept? Is this going to be on the library's website? Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, on the library's website, there is a policy tab. And currently, um, we have all the policies that have been. Um, you know, kind of approved and supported by the board up to this point are included there. Um, there is a computer uh, like access statement in that part, but it's not very well formatted. Yes, yeah, this computer use policy, um, and it is from 2011. So that's the other reason why we need to like that's a 13 year old policy that some of those things might not even like apply anymore. Yeah. So, uh, but it would be on that page, which includes the patron code of conduct, the basis policy, the historic archive and collection development policy, the donation policy, um, and then our overall collection development policy. And so we'd be updating computer use and adding the patron privacy policy to that page. So as a board, do we have to formally vote on these? Do okay. We do whether it's tonight or next month. Okay. But yeah. And so Beth, just to, so I can be clear, this patron privacy policy was a brand new policy that did not exist before. Yeah, we I don't when we updated the um website last year, I think we dropped it off entirely because it wasn't very comprehensive. Um 
and it was just rather generic um, and like didn't include the library law reference or the consumer data privacy law right. reference either. So um, we just didn't include it at all. So we kind of have been functioning without a formal you know, patron privacy policy. Like the library staff kind of, for all intents and purposes, this isn't going to change how we are doing business in the library because we already do this stuff, but we're like formally stating this is our, our position about patron privacy. So how do we feel I have as a, a board? Um, yep, I have a question. Um, I know that like we probably all get emails saying we've upgraded our privacy policy. If we pass this, it could come to fruition, whatever. Is this something that you would send out to all um, patrons, library card holders? Have you worked through that? I don't know. I don't think. Not typically. We just post it on the website so it'd okay. be accessible if somebody wanted to review it. it. Okay. Yeah. Just didn't know the ins and outs. Because I don't Thank really you. even see, I don't see this as really like an update. It's like no. a fresh creation of a policy that we haven't had in place for a long time. Okay. Just curious. And as a board, how do we feel about voting tonight? Or would people like to take a look at this and we table it and vote on it next month? Any strong feelings? Please, please, sorry. Especially, yeah, especially the city attorney's department. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the city attorney's office basically has given their okay. Um, and that's why I did, I was doing that first. So that I would be presenting like the really kind of comprehensive draft of this stuff with their input and language. Yeah, I'm comfortable voting. I am too. Um, and no, okay. I have a um, separate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you just have to do Yeah, do you want me to kind of go through highlight the? Well, I, I guess I'd like to kind of just address the patron privacy policy sure. first, and then let's get to the other one. Yeah. Okay. So, um, is there a motion to approve the patron privacy policy as written? So, Kyle, I'll second. Gina, thank you. <laughs> like I'm on Zoom, and you, you know you have to identify yourself sometimes. <laughs> you know, it's my life. Um, all in favor of approving the uh, patron privacy policy as written? Aye. Um, right. Thank you. So, here you go. Thanks, Beth. Appreciate your work on that. Okay. And then we can move on to the computer um, access. Okay. So the first paragraph of the computer access and internet use is basically just a stipulation that there's all kinds of information on the internet. We're not like the aggregators of the information. We don't know if it's true. We don't promote one thing over another. Um, and that people kind of have to make their own decisions about what is appropriate for them to look at um, um, on computers. Um, and let's see, so the, the first numbered section um, that we do make internet resources available to all patrons. So we have public computers um, that are available and we have public Wi-Fi. Um, and the staff um, provides assistance to um, individuals to, to access those resources. Um, and then if they're using their own personal devices, like on the Wi-Fi, the library has no liability for any loss or damage. So um, if there's something happens on the Wi-Fi or somebody steals their stuff out of the, you know, physically. Um, and then uh, the responsibility to erase the computer data, that's actually only on our physical library computers. So like when you log onto the computer, you do information, you log into websites, you create a document. When you log off, all of that stuff is erased and not maintained. Um, the only kind of, I guess, information that we have is based on, you know, people's use in terms of logging into the library computers. So we do because we collect that as a statistic of how many computer sessions took place. Um, so if there was some kind of legal requirement to provide data about that, like we could, but we don't release that information. We don't collect it other than to just count the number of sessions, not individual people accessed. Um, there are, is filtering software on all of the public computers. Um, 
And I believe that the Wi-Fi may have some degree of filtering, um, but I don't know if it's quite as thorough as our like hardwired network to computers. Um, and then access to inter internet resources for minors. We actually don't have public internet computers that are designated for minors, except for the two computers in the team room that are kind of accessed um, during specific program times generally. Um, and then there's no internet computers in the children's area because those four computers are just um, non, like what, like non-internet connections. But children can use the public computers, you know, in this um, large area where the computers are at or in the tech lab. Um, so basically just to protect children um, using internet services, that's the other reason why there's the um, the filtering and that that section also talks about the uh, Internet Protection Act. Um, so there's like a federal and a, a state um, law about about that. Um, and then just that we don't we're the library staff are not going to deny access to computers for children because we will allow people to use all resources in, within the library. So it's kind of again up to parents or guardians to determine if that's appropriate for their child to be doing on computers. Um, and then the last section is basically the responsibilities of patrons um, to use tech, our technology appropriately. Um, and that there are um, some specific things that are not uh, allowed, uh, specifically displaying sexually explicit images or images that might reasonably be considered immediately offensive to others, access, um, display transmission or dissemination of obscene materials or child pornography, transmit threatening or harassing materials, um, unauthorized disclosure, use or dissemination of personal information regarding minors, unauthorized access of another person's files, uh, use of another person's library card to access uh, computers, attempt to alter or damage library equipment, um, software configuration or files, um, install software on computer devices. So like all of our public computers do not allow you to like download anything um, or violate copy to write laws or software fixed agreements. And then it's our policy to report all the activities of law enforcement observed. Any questions about computer access and internet use? If you were to observe a legal activity, but then the history is complete, so there's no way to recover that. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, exactly. So that's generally, you can't really do that. I mean, we have had instances where staff members have directly observed um, a patron looking at pornography on the computer. Um, and so we just have to address it in that moment. Um, and then sometimes, I don't think that, yeah, there's no way to like recoup any type of activity after they've logged off. Um, but we've had to exclude somebody for that, I think twice actually. Um, one of them was actually in June. <laughs> I guess one of those was choreography viewing. Um, so we do kind of, and then the library guard, uh, like the security guards, keep an eye for that type of stuff too, and report it to library staff. But in terms of like other, um, kind of criminal activity, we wouldn't necessarily know um, unless law enforcement was doing investigating something that led them to like, oh, it was a library computer, even if you can't recoup anything, that's when we would require some type of court order or subpoena to review, like log on access um, for an individual. If they were like, we need to see that as proof of our case or evidence or whatever. I've never in my career encountered that, but it's out there if it needed to be. You need to put anything in here. I know it says that you'll report things to law enforcement and that is a direct repercussion of the responsibility. Do, do we need to put anything in here about like being excluded or down in the library or anything? Or is that kind of is that covered by our sort of kind of first paragraph? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that would apply more under the standards of behavior because if you're actively excluded and you return to the library, that's a situation where library staff would contact probably the police if it's an active exclusion because now they're violating the exclusion and could be um, cited for criminal trespass. Yeah. I just mean if someone does one of these things, the automatic that. Not necessarily, because even a violation of the standards of behavior does not automatically equal an exclusion. Because it may be, and it, it again, it depends on the severity, how many times has it happened in the past, uh, have you been warning this person about this, and you know that you educated them about the expectations for behavior. So I think some of these things would be kind of classified in the standards of behavior as commission of a crime. And that's how it's broadly stated in that. So I guess to that point, would we have to reference the state city standards behavior in this policy at all? I guess yeah, I think so. Yeah, okay. It's item one to a, a library computer before. Is there a click through that yeah, we have a like an authentication where you have to use um, have a library card in good standing, which essentially means it's not expired and it doesn't have fines of over fifty dollars. Uh, and so you have to, and so like if you came in here with like a Denver Public Library card, you can't use that to log into our system. It has to be authenticated as one of the uh, Englewood Public Library cards with the specific initial five check digits for our library. I actually kind of like the point here. Mm -hmm. Like I think you're backing up but if any I was reading on other computer that I have to Yeah it does and it does like so once you log in the second part is like the patron I think it's more a lot of the patron responsibility and like what's okay what's okay to do. So do a lot of people read that? Not really. Sure. But it is posted on there. So it's like log in with your number and you kind of click something and then there's a different screen that has everything listed and you have to click confirm that you're big. And it's the same similar concept for logging into the Wi-Fi. You have to agree to the terms. Yeah, and the, the Wi-Fi is more defined by the city, not even the library, because it's a city-wide public Wi-Fi. As a resident attorney, give me my story. Obviously, I'll put you under pressure, but you did, it, you know, disclose that you were an attorney. Yeah, the no. DG's office. It looks good to me. I, is this a new policy? Like the previous one we just discussed? So, yeah, and um, we do have a computer use policy listed in the website. I mean, I wouldn't call it a real policy, it's just like a blob of information. It kind of addresses all of these things but not as clearly and concisely as we've rewritten it. Yeah. So what's on the website right now would be completely replaced by this. And there's a lot of the same elements, but again, it's not written. I don't think this original computer use policy was written with any input from the city attorney. Mm -hmm. comments or concerns or what do people feel comfortable voting? We feel comfortable voting? Yes. Okay. Can I get a motion to approve the public computer access and internet use policy as written? A motion. CD. I'll second it. Thank you. And all in favor of approving the public computer access internet use policy as written, say aye. 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 Well, thanks, Beth. That's a lot of work. In addition to job description updating, which is also a lot of work. But you don't think it's going to be, and then it I was really, is, so. I was really surprised by how yeah. it's work. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, so kind of moving through here, just old business. Last month we had talked about book drops out front, and Beth was just kind of talking about accessibility and what options might exist. So yeah, updates for us. So, uh, Carrie Watson and I met with um, staff members in public works and the facilities manager to talk about removing the two book drops that are in the circle drive. 
Um, and we did decide, and when we were looking at the two boxes, there is one of them that had like a, a very small opening. You couldn't put a children's picture book or an oversized like cookbook into that book drop. So we are actually going to eliminate that book drop altogether um, because it's only accessible for um, placing in specific types of items. Um, so it's not as useful as the other three. Um, so we are going to remove that one completely. And then the other one, we scoped out a space um, in the parking garage. Um, if you're familiar with the area, it is kind of right outside this window that's designated as the motorcycle parking. It's kind of across the driveway, the first spot, and then there's a yellow zone with lines. We're going to like potentially going to designate that spot as not a parking spot, but just like a 10, 15 minute loading zone where you can pull in and the book drop will be there. And then on the driver's side, you can put your returns into the box. So Public Works does need to work with the city manager's office and um, the fire marshal to make sure that this um, would be an acceptable place to set up a drive up book return. So we're kind of just in a holding pattern, waiting for some um, feedback after Public Works talks to those uh, two. And so that's hopefully what our plan will be. Um, they We also looked at some other spaces, like the space right outside here where the two other book drops are. Um, and they were talking about how across from the book drop is that little green kind of enclosure that there's like an empty dispenser thing and then the Westward um, dispenser. They were talking about removing that entirely and put in installing a new bike rack because there is a bike rack that's like right at the driveway and it's sort of, sometimes when there's a lot of bikes there, it impedes people's walkway coming in. So they were like, this is a good opportunity to just kind of redesign this whole space out here. And they were gonna potentially Kind of redesign that too. But the other option we said, if we cannot figure out a drive up spot, um, there is a bicycle shaped bike rack out there that we would ask for them to remove that and put the third book drop right next to the other two. Because you can look at the ground and see those two book drops did used to be right there. Worst case scenario, they'd be three in a row. But I'm really trying hard to create a space where somebody could drive up and drop their items. Um, we did discuss also putting the book drop on the upper level um, as a drive up spot. Um, but Public Works is doing a lot of work on the upper level of the parking garage, and they don't they don't want to make any plans for anything until they can finish um, all the repairs that they're doing up there. So they said our best bet would be to try to designate a space on the lower level. Which would be a lot easier for library staff to retrieve materials. So that's where we're at with that. So I'll kind of continue to keep you posted as that progresses. Because I think when we initially met with them, we were hoping we would have everything kind of confirmed and planned and uh, moved, or at least planned a date for moving by the end of August. Library will close in 30 minutes. The public computers and public restrooms will close in 15 minutes and all room reservations will conclude. Thank you. Yeah, I really do like the idea of a drive up situation. If we can make that work, that would be great. Um, I still am a little bit concerned about having it under the, having all the book drops under the library because I already feel like our library is hidden in some ways. Um, and I just like the fact that around the circle drive or someplace out there, it feels a little bit more like, I don't know, something welcoming or accessible. And especially because the ballot drop box is right there. Mm -hmm. Like I find myself going and just doing them both at the same time or whatever. Um, and I'm not opposed to change, but I guess I just always, I like the accessibility of it, of the current ones out there. Um, I definitely like the idea of a drive up. So yeah, I, mean, I hope we can make that work. I just really think it would be so much better to not like to have an option where you don't even have to get out of your vehicle. Oh, for sure. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because mm -hmm. even out front right now, you still have to get out of your vehicle. Yeah. To those. Yeah. We'll keep us updated. So, um, okay. So, and we will get called again at 7 15 because the library will close at 15 minutes and the restrooms will close. <laughs> Are you practicing? I'm practicing so I can do this intercom. And it's just. <laughs> Um, okay, staff's choice. Anything from staff? I'll add we had 4th of July, over 31,000 people attended our event at Bellevue Park and Cornerstone awesome. Park. So it's that was like a big every event. resident except like 2,000 yeah. people. It's pretty crazy. Um, and tonight we've got a concert going out here in the amphitheater. So next week's the last concert of the season. It's on Thursday, 6 8 p.m. back here. Um, so stop on by. Uh, and yeah, I think that's all. You guys have anything else you want to add something? So, I'm reading it. Guys, pick up last day is August 18th for everybody in the library. Very exciting. People are getting their books. Go get your books. Go get your books. Yeah. Um, for the summer reading program. reading program. Does it conclude then? Yeah. So, it ends, I think it ends. Like the week before, but we're, we're doing prize pickup through the 18th, right? Yeah, exactly. So the 11th. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think that's all. Yeah. And I think the last like adult summer um, after hours program yeah. is the August second. Not the third. It's not Saturday. Third. third. Yeah, yeah, August third is the second annual Cornwall tournament. Oh, oh, oh. so. <laughs> That's um, for all ages, families are welcome. There will be other yard games too. Yeah. <laughs> Where's it going to be? Um, Centennial Park, Million One. So that's it. Hannah and I went to AOA at the end of June. Um, American, Library, American Library Association Conference. Um, so it was just. A gathering of librarians across the country, a few across the world. Um, it was really fun. I was in San Diego for the day of the concert. Great to the library. Great. Great. Thank you for sharing. Um, anything from the Englewood schools? Yeah, a couple things. Uh, first of all, some of you may know and some of you may not know that the superintendent, Joanna Paulson, was uh, invited to read at Bellevue Park. She handed out uh, some books that promoted Englewood schools on the 12th. She was also honored by the Englewood Rotary with the Paul Harris Award. If you know, you know. <laughs> Then uh, we're, ha we're holding registration sessions at RDAP with translation available for families that need it or want it with online registration. Uh, the first board meeting is August 6th. First day of school is August 13th. Facility uh, rentals are back available again, and there are some stipulations. So visit our website to put in a request and to view the stipulations. Uh, other than that, I think that pretty much covers it. Right. It's hard to believe that uh, it, people are preparing for school already. No, yeah, it's like it just got out. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. Well, great. Thanks for sharing. And that's great news about the superintendent. I know she's uh, she's well deserved of a lot of awards. So, um, any board member have anything that they would like to share or comment on? I wanted to ask um, Christina if. Uh, Sorry, I could have gone through city council meetings and stuff, but was everything approved from our capital projects? Or do you have any updates on yes. that? Uh, well, we're still in the budget process now. Uh, we Got have it. two okay. projects on there for the library um, to update the entryway on the south side here, um, add a security exit over by the parent room on the other side, emergency exit, um, and do a few other things. So that that's uh, ranked high in the capital projects. Um, and okay. then the other one was for new library furniture at the $30,000 mark. So that's also ranked high. So, so far, so good. Fingers crossed. They'll keep moving okay. forward. I think, I think we're in good shape based off of where they're ranked. Okay, good. Thanks. If there's nothing else, then I'm going to call the meeting to conclude at 7.06. Thank you, Gina. Thanks.
Bye, guys. Thank you, guys. Before you leave, if you don't mind, if you recall, well, and Debbie, maybe you can explain this a little better than I yeah. about the grandmother who um, lost her granddaughter, an 11 year old. Okay, let me. Um, I was going to say, I'll find the email again. I guess.